Narain, I can go live now. Yes, sir. Okay, excellent. So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first webinar of 2023. And we have a very special guest today, all the way from California, Michael Green. Welcome to Marcellus's webinar. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And we've got Achint from New York. So, uh, so it's an all-American, you know, both East and West Coast of America represented uh, uh, on this webinar. And, and the reason we've got Michael is he's, a, he's an expert on a subject that should be of interest to plenty of people in India. And that subject is, uh, in Michael's words, the greatest story ever told, the, the shift in equity markets from, from active investing to passive investing. I, I think many of us would have read in the newspapers, in the US stock market, Passive investors now make up the majority of uh, of the American. Or the uh, passive investors account for a higher share of American market activity now than America than than active investors do. And the shift from active to passive has major implications for the for the, the structure of the market, for volatility, for cost of capital. Michael is a acclaimed expert on the subject. Uh, he he's, he's, uh, his work has been presented. He's presented his work to the IMF, to the Federal Reserve, the BIS, amongst others. His day job, in his day job, he's the portfolio manager and chief strategist of Simplify Asset Management. Before Simplify, Michael held a similar role in, in a firm called Logica Capital Advisors. So the role that Michael did before Logica will be of interest to plenty of Indians. Michael managed macro strategies at Thiel Macro. Uh, this is the investment firm that manages the personal wealth of Peter Thiel. Prior to that, Michael managed a discretionary global macro fund, which was seeded by Soros, Soros Fund Management. Uh, so clearly a, a distinguished career in capital markets. He's a graduate of the Wharton School at UPenn. He's also a CFA charter holder. So without further ado, let's begin our 2023 first webinar with a man who's, the, who's an expert on the greatest story ever told. Over to you, Michael. Fantastic. Um, well, so I'll, I'll launch into screen share here very quickly because nobody really wants to see my face all that much. Um, as uh, Sarah pointed out, this is what I refer to as the greatest story ever sold, actually. And it's one of the reasons that I emphasize the dynamics around passive investment as being a function of marketing. Um, the first thing that people tend to uh, need to really understand is what passive investing is supposed to be, right? So this is analysis that goes back to kind of the Bible of why you should passively invest. It's a paper, relatively short paper written by Bill Sharp. You may know him from the Sharp Ratio. He also was critical in the original form formulation of modern portfolio theory, many of the techniques that we use for portfolio construction. In 1991, he wrote a paper explaining what was meant by passive and active. And so passive, when we refer to it, is an investor who always holds every security in the market in proportion to what is available in the market. It's an attempt to basically capture the return of all of the risk assets in a market. Now, there's all sorts of components that play into this theory, the definition of completeness in markets. Can I actually gain access to every security? Are some securities held privately, et cetera? These are all somewhat secondary to the debate that emerges on a close examination of his hypothesis which is a passive investor always holds every security. Well, that raises an important question. How does a in passive investor get into the market? Because they can't always hold. They have to buy and they have to sell to get in and out. And as a result, you either believe that the way that they get into markets is magic, or you actually discover that he outlines exactly what these vehicles are. They're not passive investors. They're active investors that operate off of the world's simplest rule. Did you give me cash? If so, then buy. Did you ask for cash? If so, then sell. And since we now have a brand new class or a rapidly growing class of a particular type of investor who operates off of a very simple algorithm, it becomes extraordinarily reasonable to start asking the question, well, if they're active investors, what's the impact that they have on the market? Uh, there we go. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Um, so I mentioned the idea that passive has become the largest share within the U.S. markets. It's tough to overstate how important they have become. I just want to emphasize, this is not my work. This is work from Morningstar. It's been cited by the Federal Reserve in a paper in May 2020. A paper is called, asks the question, is passive investing a systematic risk? 
And it reads exactly as you might expect it to after the author, Ken Anadu, spent some time talking with me. I obviously think this is a huge issue, right? You can see it's grown from less than 2% market share in 1995 to an excess of 40% market share as of 2020. Um, many estimates around passive focus on the market share of ETFs, exchange traded funds, or simply of mutual funds. Unfortunately, that's kind of like the analysis of an iceberg. It's missing the biggest part because it's below the surface, which is replication strategies, people using futures, institutions that choose to buy exposure to the S&P through a total return swap or through internal indexing, et cetera. Um, the reason why I just want to highlight this very, very quickly is that this is increasingly facilitated by a regulatory framework. So in 2006, there was what's called the, two, the Pension Protection Act in the United States. It's actually mandated that when you get a job in the United States, you get what's called a 401k, an after-tax, a pre-tax savings plan that's withdrawn from your paycheck automatically. In 2006, participation in that became a non-voluntary component. It basically, you had to decide not to participate if you wanted to not participate. The second thing that happened was they had, if you're going to participate, they have to put you into a vehicle. Increasingly, those funds are directed into passive strategies. So as of today, if I look at the dynamics of this share gain, what's really going on is, is that nobody is buying active managers. Everybody is buying passive managers. So more than 100% of the money that is coming into the market is now passive in its structure. And in fact, um, uh, an academic, Alex Chinko and Marco, Marco Salmon, I was a participant in a paper presentation that they gave earlier in 2022, in which they gave the classic academic response of, well, passive share is around 15%. I actually challenged them on that. They, to their credit, went back and then wrote a paper in August, of, August 3rd of 2022, once they recognized that the passive ownership share was more than double what they thought. So the standard academic interpretation has been the passive is about 15% market share. Um, Marco Salmon and Chinko broadly agree with my analysis that suggests it's now north of 40%. Their minimum estimate as of 2020 was around uh, 38%. They would agree with me that we're gaining about 3% a year in terms of market share for passive. So roughly 44 to 45% of the US market is now completely passive in its construction. Okay, why does this matter? Well, the work that I'm talking about here, actually, again, so reference my work with Peter Thiel, this is the same analysis that led me to place a sizable trade against a product called the XIV, which was uh, exploiting a particular subsegment of the US market, what are called inverse volatility ETFs. These strategies had gotten to the point that these simple systematic and passive strategies associated with what's called the VIX or the volatility complex had grown so large that they were about two thirds of the market on any given day. The reason that that became an opportunity was I recognized that if an event occurred that caused them to transact at higher levels of the normal frequency, basically just a small in the historical sense, but a large drop in the S&P, basically around 4%, um, that that would create conditions under which these funds would then swamp the liquidity in their market that would create an extraordinary event and lead to these funds plunging to zero, which is unfortunately exactly what happened. Now, if we look at the dynamics of what's happening in terms of the share gain process, this is what I was referring to earlier. And John Bogle, the founder of Vanguard himself, recognized aspects of this. If everybody indexed, the only word you could use is chaos, catastrophe, the markets would fail. Now, the analysis that he did was looking at steady state components. What happens if I have a market that's 10% passive? What happens if I have a market that's 20% passive, 30%, et cetera? Came to the conclusion that the market could get to be about 85% passive before all hell broke loose, as he puts it, catastrophe. The problem, as I mentioned, is nobody studied the process of getting there. And so currently, we have a market that is actually more than 100% passive in the United States. Fundamental trading is a percentage of total U.S. equity turnover is now well below 10%. So when you're seeing what's happening to Apple Computer or to your Tesla shares or to whatever you've decided to invest in the United States, understand that increasingly what's actually going on is just machines trying to balance the portfolio. 
right? Now, if we want to look for evidence for how this should be impacting markets, how does passive investing impact markets? Well, just think about it logically. If we have strategies that buy all the securities together, we should see an increase in correlation in the securities. We should see an increase in valuation of securities because of the methodology. The dynamics of how passive works is it buys what has gone up most last. Each incremental dollar that comes in biases something that went up yesterday. As a result, that shows up as rising valuations in aggregate. We should also see reduced market elasticity, right? meaning that markets are less capable of absorbing new information because those trading on information are becoming a smaller and smaller fraction of the market. That raises the risk of extraordinary price movements, an increase in market concentration as the momentum bias leads to the largest companies becoming larger. I want to emphasize that is particularly important to India, and we're going to talk about this at the end, of, towards the end of the presentation. The last component is as you become more and more passive, it becomes harder and harder for companies to become public. And I just want to pause on that one for a second, because imagine what's actually happening for a country like India that is trying to attract external capital. When you think about a passive strategy that is buying stuff in proportion to the already public market, there's no mechanism for the inclusion of publicly traded vehicles except through some bizarre components like SPACs in the United States, which are now being regulated out of existence. But this is actually really important for a country like India that's looking at the dynamics of capital formation. You gotta be really thoughtful about how much passive money you want to allow into your markets. All right, so let's talk about the correlation for a second. Um, one of the things we're seeing very clearly is that properly defined, properly controlled for extraneous events, we're seeing record levels of correlation in the United States. Now, one of the challenges is when we talk about correlation, those of you who have gone to one of the excellent IITs in, in India will know that there's very difficult to do the mathematical calculations for correlations on large numbers of securities. Um, in the case of the S&P 500, you need a 500 by 500 covariance matrix. It's continuously calculated with the weights, et cetera. Or you can do what Americans are well known for, which is take a shortcut. Right. You can ask a really simple question. Did two stocks move in the same direction on the same day? What's called co-movement. They're controlling for levels of volatility in the U.S. markets. We can first do the calculation going back over a very long period of time. And second, a very distinct pattern emerges. Once indexes became the dominant player in what's called the futures market, effectively tapping into vehicles that assign the responsibility to the rest of the market to go out and try to match these underlying exposures, correlations began to rise. Crazily enough, this is actually what caused the dot-com cycle in the United States, which offers both promise for a country like India and also some pretty severe warnings. When I highlight that dynamic um, of what occurred in the dot-com cycle, this was a function of all the issues we've talked about. Improperly defining how many shares are available to the public was the critical contributor to the dot-com cycle in the United States. When a player like Vanguard tries to replicate the market and looks at the market it was, as it was constructed in the 1990s, it was all weighted on the basis of market cap. This, um, most people think that's still the case. It's actually what's called float weighted market cap. So if a company has privately held shares, it carries a lower weight in the index. But in the 1990s, as Vanguard was going out and try to buy every stock in the S&P 500, they were trying to buy twice as many shares of companies like Microsoft, Cisco, and Dell, leading to outperformance for those, in, for those components. Um, we saw exactly this mechanic play out in China in 2015 where you may remember that the Chinese stock market soared by over 500% over a relatively brief period of time. The reason that that happened was the exact same. The definition of the market cap indices in China in 2015 was market cap weighted, not float adjusted. That meant that as foreigners tried to buy into the Chinese market, they were buying more shares than were actually available, causing those companies to skyrocket and causing companies to literally go limit up every single day with no transactions. That was what actually powered the boom in the Chinese stock market. Again, this is a warning as well as an encouragement. You can take advantage of opportunities like that to bring in capital from the rest of the world, but you also have to understand exactly why it's happening because it can lead to really terrible capital allocation choices.
okay, if we're going to talk about how passive managers impact the market, the very first thing we have to do is figure out how active managers behave on average. This was academic work that I did that was proprietary. I was surprised that no other academic had actually done this. And I don't really consider myself an academic, just to be clear. But I went out and I surveyed investors and I asked them a really simple question. You're a portfolio manager. You have roughly 5% cash in your portfolio. So you're not worried about cash in one direction or another. And you receive new money coming in. What is the likelihood that you're going to deploy those funds or sell securities if this is a redemption given some type of valuation. And these two curves that I'm showing here are your marginal propensity to sell and your marginal propensity to buy given some level of valuation. Now, what was actually really interesting about this analysis is not that it unsurprisingly tells me that managers are more likely to sell at super high valuations and more likely to buy at very low valuations. It's actually the intersection between the two at 16 times, which is exactly the market's historical average, right? If roughly 50% of the managers are willing to buy at 16 times and roughly 50% are willing to sell at 16 times, well, that should be the long-term equilibrium of the market. If we run this through a simulation, that's exactly what emerges. A mean reverting market, which is what we were all raised to believe we ultimately had. Valuations may go up and then they'll come down. But if I introduce a vehicle like Passive that operates under the world's simplest algorithm, if you give me cash, then buy. If you ask for cash, then sell. In other words, 100% marginal propensity to buy, 100% marginal propensity to sell. Then I end up shifting that market off of that equilibrium. And if I run that same simulation, what do I get? Rising valuations over time. Right now, this is exactly what we're seeing in the United States. Despite the fact that we've just had a massive bear market in the United States, with stocks down 20% and earnings actually growing well in the United States, we've only seen valuations retreat to close to above the average, right? We're around 19 times earnings in the S&P versus 16 times over history. We're not really showing any real retreat. And when you take into account what's happened to interest rates in the United States, we should be at much lower valuations than we're at. Right now, we actually see this in terms of the empirical results. Here's where this is looking at the median price to sales for the S&P. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to use the sales number to smooth out some of the profitability cycles. I'm also using the median because I don't want to capture the extreme movements around, say, a dot-com cycle, et cetera. And there we see exactly what we would expect, rising valuations on a median price to sales over time, exactly as the model predicts. There's another reason why this is really important. And the reason why this influences market structure is because of the different way that you treat cash in a passive vehicle. So your typical active manager, Saurabh, for example, will hold cash when he receives an allocation until he finds something that he really thinks is attractive. It could be reallocated into his existing portfolio, but he also recognizes the optionality associated with that cash. Now, passive vehicles dispense with that, put 100% of the capital to work. I'll show you this in a second, but the world's largest mutual fund is a passively run entity, the Vanguard Total Market Index. In aggregate, it's about $1.6 trillion in assets, and it carries somewhere around $100 million in cash. That's an impossibly low amount of cash. All right now, what does this actually mean though, as I move from investors who don't, who, who value cash for its option value to investors who manage cash or value cash simply as a, a distraction, right? They don't want to hold it. Well, most people would think moving from 95% stocks to 100% stocks or 99.9% stocks would cause stocks to go up 5%. But this is actually helping to clue us into the problem. If we run that analysis, we discover that's not the case at all. all right? So let's just walk through a super simple model of how a market actually works. Pretend there's $1,000 that's invested in total in the market. It's all held by active managers. And so by definition, it's $950 of equities and $50 of cash. I decide I'm going to try out this new, this new passive strategy. So I have to take $10 away from the active managers, redeploy it to the passive managers. Oops. At this point, 
All the equities are still held with the active managers. They have less cash than they want to have. Passive has all cash. Now a transaction has to occur because active wants to get back to the 5% cash. Passive wants to get to 99.9% .9 invested. Well, that's very straightforward. So active has to sell 950. Passive has to buy 999. Wait a second. That's not how markets work. That's not a transaction. The seller can't be at 950 and the buyer at 999. You actually have to solve this problem iteratively, right? This is a negotiation that occurs to lead to a transaction, which is what we actually see in prices on the screen. When we run through that analysis, the passive has to deploy the 999. The active has a choice about selling the 950. As a result, buying is more aggressive than selling. When you run this in an iterative fashion, you discover that the market solution is equity valuations rise. If we run through this in passive share gain, again, we see further increase in equity valuations, right? And it becomes exponential as we move forward. Crazily enough, a market that goes from 0% active to 100% or for 0% passive to 100% passive would lead to valuations rising 50x, not 50%, not 5%. We're talking a Schiller PE going from an average of 16 to a Schiller PE going to around 900, All right? Now, obviously that's not gonna happen before that occurs. Volatility goes absolutely insane. And again, this is an opportunity for countries like India because you're in a favorable portion of this. We'll talk about this explicitly as we move forward. Just to illustrate that cash point. So here's one class of that Vanguard total market index. $885 billion worth of market cap, $85 million worth of cash, All right? Just imagine if it was 1% cash, right? That should be $9 billion in cash that this company, that this fund is holding. They're holding less than one one hundredth of that. This is a vehicle that is completely dependent on market liquidity for its own liquidity. All right. Um, another factor we'd expect to see is volatility on fundamental events like earnings announcements rises for the very simple reason that now half the market doesn't care. There is no participation from Vanguard when Apple reports earnings, right? They don't participate. Nothing changes. They don't, nothing has occurred from their perspective. They don't even have an analyst who's following the earnings call. So when other people go to transact on the information, they discover that market liquidity is less than they would expect. And we see this trend of rising prices. This is actually a, a chart from Goldman Sachs that I love because it focuses on the average, right? This is not something that has an average. This is a trend upwards. We're seeing this continue. This ended in 2020. As of today, we're out here, right? You've seen this with companies like Facebook, or Tesla on their earnings, or Apple on their earnings, or for that matter, Walmart on their earnings have seen extraordinary price movements. All right. Again, why is this happening? Because when you move to passive, markets become more inelastic. This is an academic paper that came out in 2021. And I just want to highlight almost all of the academic research that I'm hitting for you here is in the last two years. Right? There's a revolution underway in academics around understanding of how markets work. And one of the things we're discovering is, is that the change in investor profile from active to passive has a huge impact on the behavior of markets. The way I describe it to people is when you want to execute a trade, when you go into markets and you try to transact, it's like reaching into a bag and pulling out a marble. If you pull out a white marble, you get a discretionary investor who can theoretically transact with you. If you pull out a black marble, you've pulled out, I'm sorry, a black marble is a discretionary trader. If you pull out a black marble, they can theoretically trade with you. You can negotiate your point of transaction. If you pull out a white marble, which is a passive vehicle, you have nobody to transact with unless they receive an instruction from a third party, right? They don't have the capability to execute a trade with you. As a result, if you imagine this bag filling up with white marbles, you're gonna to have to spend more and more time searching for an appropriate trading partner. Markets become increasingly illiquid and importantly, what's called discontinuous. Discontinuity is a very big deal in markets. That's what the crash in 1987 was.
that's what the events of Lehman Brothers were in, in uh, 2008, right? It's where a market suddenly discovers that the next price is radically different. That has implications for collateral measures, credit creation, et cetera. So all these factors become incredibly important. Um, the next component is, is that the passive model allocates more money to the largest stocks that drives them higher. And again, regulators are participating here, right? So in 2019, the level of concentration got so extreme that many popular strategies like the S&P 500 growth, right? So buying the stocks that are the more expensive, more growth oriented names than the S&P 500 became so concentrated that it actually failed the test of what's called the 40 Act, right? So the, what defined modern mutual funds, et cetera, in the US. One of the requirements is, is that those funds be appropriately diversified. In 2019, they weren't. And the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission in the United States said, oh, that's not a problem. Don't worry about it, right? Because you're just trying to mimic an index, we're not gonna penalize these funds. We're gonna allow them to continue to be marketed to the US public. And as a result, concentration has risen further and further. It's also been a key contributor to the collapse that we've seen in US equity markets as money has tried to move out of those theoretically most valuable largest stocks. This is a bubble unwinding. Okay. Unfortunately, the story doesn't stop with equities and in many ways it's much worse in bonds. What drove all the negative interest rate bonds? Who was buying them? Well, guess what? It was American retirees. Vanguard, BlackRock, Capital Group, all large providers of American retiree funds were the biggest buyers of things like German 10-year bonds yielding minus 0.7%. This is where it gets even crazier, right? Because why is that occurring? Well, if I construct a bond index on a market cap weighted basis, what bonds go up the most in price when interest rates fall? Very long dated, low coupon bonds. They have the highest what's called duration. As a result, they exploded in price. And I don't have a picture of it here, but Sarub, you, at some point you might want to share with the audience what's happened to the Austrian century zero coupon bond. All right, so this is a government issued bond where interest rates have gone from 0.6% to um, at issue to roughly 3.5% today. That zero coupon bond has gone from par to six. In other words, investors in a risk-free government bond have now lost 94 cents of every dollar that they put in. Like, these are extraordinary events. And of course, the largest buyer of that product was Vanguard. Okay, um, there's also reduced ability for new companies to become public and Sarov is a perfect person to have on here because when you think about what's happening with an IPO or an initial public offering, that stock by definition is not in the index, right? It, there is no capacity for a passive manager to buy it. It requires an active manager to meet with the management team, assess the prospects of the company and say, I'm willing to take a risk and deviate from the benchmark of currently available companies because I find this story so compelling, I'm gonna put money into it. If there are no active managers or if active managers have been damaged by the growth of passive strategies, then you can't get companies into public market. And this is exactly what we saw in the United States until 2020, 21, when a phenomenon called SPACs took off and went absolutely crazy. All right, so we saw lower and lower numbers of IPOs in the United States. We actually had negative um, uh, public company formation. We went from roughly 5,700 companies in the United States that were publicly traded to today we're around 3,300 that are publicly traded. SPACs, I'm sure you've heard of this. This was a crazy experience in 2020, 21. And unfortunately, it also has passive at the heart of it. So this is the, the index methodology for the Vanguard total market index that I showed you before. And you'll notice that special purpose acquisitions have a carve out here. They're not eligible for index participation, right? Now that seems like that has no impact whatsoever, except for the rules around how you incorporate new companies into the market indices. 
the traditional process of doing an IPO requires between six to 12 months worth of what's called seasoning for that company to be considered for inclusion into the benchmark. But when you do it through a SPAC, the vehicle becomes eligible for index inclusion in as few as five trading days. Right now, why did SPACs go absolutely crazy? Again, the rules of SPACs are that the insiders are prevented from selling for a minimum of 20 days, right? And certain levels of price appreciation have to be realized. Well, if the insiders who control all the shares can't sell and Vanguard has to buy, guess what happens to prices? They go vertical. And this is what we saw over and over and over again in 2020 and 2021. Um, again, absolute fraud specs, things like Nikola, right? This is the truck being rolled downhill. Look who the largest holders are, right? Vanguard and BlackRock, big buyers and continue to buy, by the way. Until this company is delisted, they will continue to buy the shares in this company as they receive new allocations of capital. I mean, this is the perfect environment in which to conduct fraud. By the way, that's not the advice for India. I just want to be clear. Okay, um, how else would we expect a market transitioning from active to passive behave? Well, I talked about these extreme moves. We actually are seeing this in the skew, the behavior of daily returns in US markets. Markets are becoming increasingly negatively skewed as passive is becoming larger and larger. The problems are not just that stocks are moving upwards, but also that if somebody needs to sell and passive on that day has exhausted its allotment of buying, there's no liquidity. It's leading to markets exhibiting increasingly negative skew in the distribution. This is super important for me. It's what plays into the analysis of option markets. The distribution is changing. Many of you are familiar with the work of Nassim Taleb and things like the black swan, right? Or fooled by randomness. This is actually a very physical implementation that's influencing the actual distribution in markets creating conditions under which options can be very improperly valued. This is the opportunity set for me. Okay, what is it also creating though? This is actually shaking the very core foundation of how we think about portfolios. Because at the center of the assumptions behind portfolio construction is what in modern finance is what's called modern portfolio theory, which holds this idea that asset returns can be largely modeled as normally distributed around some expected return level by establishing the characteristics of expected risk and expected return, I can optimize portfolio construction, right? Now, that's assuming that this is true. Unfortunately, what I just showed you is that the distribution is actually getting shifted in an exponential fashion, right? And when I shift an asset in an exponential fashion, I have really unexpected results. One of which was, is, that alpha for active managers disappears, right? Again, calling out to the IIT grads, if you think about the dynamics of what you're actually measuring with alpha, this concept of excess return, the way it's defined is in a linear fashion. Y, the portfolio return equals MX, right? The slope times the market return or beta times the market return plus alpha. If I use a linear solution for what is now an exponential or curved surface, look what has to happen to my intercepts. They have to get shifted downwards. In other words, alpha or active management has to fall in the presence of passive share gain. Right now, this is 180 degrees from the narrative that exists in the market today, which is, well, the reason why alphas are falling or poor for active managers is because they're terrible. Right? or they're competing with themselves. And once passive gets large enough, then the active managers will outperform. Well, that's just not true. The problem with active management, ironically, is actually the growth of passive management. Again, a theoretical framework, this is just a model-derived result, almost perfectly matches the realized results. Right, so we can believe one of two things, either over the course of my career, and this is certainly possible by the way, active managers have just gotten uniquely terrible at managing assets, or there's an external force that's causing this. Okay, 
I'm sure there's a, a bunch of questions around this. Um, we can come back to questions of um, whether the analysis is right or not. But first, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about where there's opportunity and risk for India in particular. One of the things that comes out of this is as passive share gains, volatility changes in markets, right? The initial implementation of passive is actually super valuable because what I'm doing is I'm introducing a new player into the market that operates off a different rule set, right? It's a heterogeneous implement uh, introduction into an environment. Imagine going into a flea market or a bazaar. If there's a bunch of people there, all are trying to accomplish exactly the same thing. Everybody wants to show up and buy radishes, right? Well, then markets are going to exhibit a lot of volatility as people compete to get to the radish stalls. But if people are capable of <clears throat> going for totally different reasons, you know what, I'm gonna actually return some radishes or I'm here to buy tomatoes, garlic, et cetera, you're gonna get a heterogeneous market that exhibits a lower volatility when you introduce a new player that simply says, oh, I'll buy anything you try to sell me. Right, that actually drives volatility lower in its initial implementation. India is here, the US is here. One of the features of the market that has largely escaped most market participants' observations is implied volatilities and realized volatilities in the US for the S&P 500 are now significantly higher Right, for a 500 stock portfolio, which should exhibit higher diversification benefits they're now significantly higher in the United States than they are in countries like India or Korea or elsewhere, right? So the Sensex, for example, or the Nifty are showing implied levels and realized levels of volatility in the teens while the US is in the 20s. Historically, this is totally aberrant. My analysis is, is it's a function of where we are in the passive penetration cycle. India has a moment of honeymoon, basically, where your markets are being made more robust by the penetration of passive strategies. You're also not yet at the point where the active manager alpha has been forced hugely negative, right? India is here, the US is here. It's getting harder. More active managers are beginning to underperform in India. I'm starting to read the headlines about the challenges of active managers in India as passive investment is coming from the rest of the world into India. Nobody's made the connection yet, but I'm watching exactly this behavior play through. Now, India can benefit from elements of this by attracting external capital and creating conditions that look a little bit like the Chinese stock market bubble in 2015. But ultimately, that backfires because it drives people away from markets as you try to come out. It's really important that India start to get ahead of this and start to think about how can we take advantage of this. Regulation is key to exploiting the foreign inflows of capital for India's benefit. If your primary mechanism is the nifty 50, right, and an, alleg an, an, an allegory for the United States in the 1970s, then only 50 stocks are benefiting, right? If I choose to invest in India by putting money with the established companies through a passive vehicle that's charging me almost nothing to participate, right, then I'm not giving individuals like Sarub the opportunity to say, hey, here's new and innovative companies. Instead, we end up with a situation where basically, here's again, the Vanguard Total International Stock Fund Index. This would be a primary vehicle for which people would invest in the United States. You'll notice it has lots of developed markets and down here is India at about 5% of the index and really only about $14 billion through this vehicle. There's lots of others like them coming into India. But importantly, all that money is basically going into companies like Reliance Industries, right? And Reliance Industries is trading at a huge premium to its peers around the world, right? Do we wanna drive more money to Reliance Industries? Or do we wanna give money to the new innovative companies in India that require capital? It's really gonna be a function of the choices that you make from this point. All right, I conclude my presentation with a quote from Voltaire, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. We know markets are not efficient. We know this, that they are not frictionless. We know that passive investors are not actually passive. But this is how people are increasingly accessing India from outside the rest of the, the from outside India. And with Indian India, you have to be really thoughtful about this.
because I guarantee you, exactly as occurred in the United States, BlackRock and Vanguard are super active in lobbying for access for retirement savings programs, et cetera, in India. They're going to tell you all the stories about why passive strategies are the best way to do this. They're not telling you the truth. That's where we'll stop. Thank you very much, Michael. That was breathtaking. Uh, it's given us more than enough food for thought for this weekend. Um, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling in questions, folks. Uh, like, every, uh, like in every webinar, please stick your questions in the Q&A box uh, in front of you. And my colleague Achint will, will uh, moderate uh, uh, those questions and we'll take as many as you can. So, so Michael, just to sort of you know, uh, uh, understand the context in which Passive took off in America. From what I know, mid '90s was the transition point when Passive started rocketing, and you know, there's been no looking back ever since. What was the catalyst then? Because I'm trying to figure out whether India too will run into a similar catalyst. Yeah, so India is already past that catalyst um, in its implementation, but in the United States in the early 1990s, as Passive went from about one percent market share to two percent market share, they began to encounter a problem with what's called tracking error. At that point in time, Vanguard was the largest player in the space. State Street, Wells Fargo were other players on the institutional side. Prior to 1994, the only way that they could create an index was by going and buying the individual stocks themselves. That um, meant that when they tried to buy small or illiquid companies, they were influencing the price of those companies. That would influence their performance much more than the index leading to tracking error. In 1994, the SEC, on at the request of Wall Street, convened what was called the Derivatives Committee. And I'm going to um, pull up my chart again here just to show this. Can I put that there? Okay. So in 1994, Vanguard. Um, approached Wall Street saying, look, we have this problem with tracking error. Is there anything that could be done about it? And the street's response is, well, you should just go out and buy futures. Why are you trying to buy every single stock? The, re the answer to that is actually buried in this Investment Company Act of 1940. In order to use futures, you have to have a margin account. Um, the Investment Company Act of 1940 prohibits mutual funds from using leverage or having margin accounts unless it's fully disclosed to investors. In the aftermath of the Great Depression, nobody wanted to use margin. And as a result, the investment funds, the investment vehicles that emerged like index funds did not have the capability to do margin accounts. In 1994, the SEC basically said, oh, well, that's silly. Let's get rid of that rule. We're going to now allow index providers to have margin accounts and they will be able to use futures to enter the market as compared to buying the individual securities. That took a Vanguard problem and made it a market problem. I that know. was really the key thing that powered the growth because suddenly the Vanguards et cetera of the world are capable of participating in an almost unlimited fashion without worrying about tracking error or anything else. Amazing. So, so I think some of you are asking us whether uh, whether uh, this Sevi has been uh, whether this material has been presented to Sevi. So we invited uh, Sevi to attend uh, today's session with Michael. I think there is some participation from the regulator on this call itself, but we'll also uh, make sure that that the recording uh, of this uh, session is shared with all our clients, and uh, we will try to bring it to the attention of the regulator because as I think as everybody who's listening has figured out, this has significant ramifications for how India's capital markets are developed. Uh, Achint, over to you. Sure. Uh, so Michael, as expected, the Q&A box is buzzing. Uh, so I'll go with the first question uh, from a gentleman named Vivek. He asks that uh, apart from expanding the number of stocks in the frontline index and uh, reworking of the index to, in to include free float, is there any other solution to this issue? And uh, what does this dynamic do uh, to prospects of private market investing? Um, so I think there's a couple of things that are important. One is, again, to recognize that we're currently at a positive point in this. So India is actually going to benefit from this for another couple of years before it becomes, this goes back to the point that I was making, India is here, the US is here, right? So in a weird way, um, you're in almost the perfect position to start to change the rules to tweak it. 
investment committees around the world can't help but look at a country like India and notice that it has lower volatility, even as it's offering returns that are potentially superior to the United States, that it has a ton of opportunity for internal growth and development, particularly as China is removed. And that's one other component that I would just highlight is, is within the US, the relationships with China are deteriorating rapidly. Um, if I go back and I look at that index construction, you'll notice that China is much bigger than India. It's about three and a half times the size of India in terms of inclusion in the indices. If China is downgraded and reduced for various governance reasons, similar to Americans saying, well, we're not going to invest in the Soviet Union or we're not going to invest in Germany in 1939, um, you'll see an increase in allocation to India that's going to all benefit India. You can broaden out the index. You can also start to basically put in subsidies for things like new capital investments that encourage people to put money into new vehicles. You can make it easier for companies to become public. You can improve the disclosure dynamics. And candidly, you can encourage the growth of active managers like Sarub and others who remain tiny relative to the overall potential opportunity in countries like India. But the, the biggest thing that I would just highlight is don't do something stupid like mandate passive indices in a national retirement system, which is what we've done in the United States. Like just resist that with every fiber of your being. Sure, sure. Uh, and uh, I think the second part of this question was, what does this do to the, pro the prospects of private market investing? Uh, so any thoughts on that? Well, it depends, again, where you are in the cycle. So one of the reasons that you've seen an explosion of growth in private investing in the United States is because of this volatility dynamic. Ironically, the old name for things like private equity, right, was, was levered equity or, um, you know, levered buyout. They soon recognized that levered is a name that connotates risk. And as a result, they moved to private equity. It also meant that they didn't have to publish marks on their performance on a daily basis or a monthly basis, or even really on a quarterly basis. You're seeing this in the United States right now in credit markets where privately traded vehicles are saying, no, 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 our, our assets are, are you know, more valuable than the public markets would suggest, right? Um, in the presence of rising volatility, what do you seek out as, as an investor? Lower volatility assets, despite their leverage, private equity and venture capital and everything else were perceived as less volatile than public markets. That's absurd. Like, that's, just, that's just silliness when you really think about it. And candidly, it's kind of silly to think that India is a less volatile market than the US, except because of these dynamics, it is, right? India is at a stage of development where it should be riskier. It should be more volatility, right? This is an, an aberrant condition under, that you guys can take advantage of. Sure. Uh, another question from one of the participants is that, uh, given that you've studied uh, the, the pattern of passive investing in the US, uh, what do you think uh, will be the timeline of a similar shift in India? So in the US, it would have taken close to two decades. Uh, how much time do you think it takes India to get there? Well, unfortunately, I think the risk for countries like India, if, you know, I, I can't say any other way, if poor policy choices are made, right? India is taking all the important steps of trying to modernize and financialize itself. It's introducing vehicles for investment for the public. It's encouraging people to move away from traditional savings vehicles like gold into public equities, public credit markets, et cetera. This is actually super important as that's happening and creates huge positive ramifications. Not to slam gold, but the simple reality is, is all that gold did was protect you from the depredations of very poor fiscal and monetary policy, right? When you decide to participate in the system by investing in financial assets, you're creating the potential for huge growth and improvement in Indian society. Very clear that India has embraced that and is trying to move forward on it. But the, the really key thing to recognize is that if that becomes corrupted, with a flawed model of how markets work and you embrace things like passive investing, then you're gonna exacerbate all of these conditions and it's gonna happen faster. Just like India skipped landlines and went straight to cell phones, you could very easily skip the entire process of developing a class of active managers capable of allocating capital and move to passive vehicles with all the, the, the ramifications I'm talking about and do it faster than the United States. I guarantee you Vanguard is better funded and more active in lobbying the Indian government than I am. 
or Sarub is or, or anyone else on this call. So on that point, uh, Michael, if I may, several people are asking, uh, you know, whether there's basically a way for them to deal with uh, deal with this. Uh, several people in our client base, we don't invest in America, but several of our clients invest in the American market. So basis what Simplify does, basis your expertise. Is there a panacea for uh, Indian high net worth individuals who are trying to access the American market but don't want to get fried by fried by what seems like a fairly scary situation? It is a very scary situation. And I'll tell you just candidly, like other than the recognition that India has its own very particular risks and, and um, there are, uh, you know, the, it, it, India's path of development remains far from certain, although it definitely is moving more rapidly down that path and has a number of tailwinds to help it. I guess I would just flip it around and say like, given everything that I've said to you, why invest in the United States, right? I mean, like if you can find individual companies that you think are really attractive and basically can offer you a return by dividend payments or share repurchases that seem particularly attractive to you, then go for it. But if you're gonna try to invest in the United States by simply buying the S&P 500, then yes, I mean, you can participate in higher valuations as passive continues to gain share, but you also are creating risks. That's why I introduced the XIV. We're creating risks of extraordinary events that we'll look back afterwards and say like, well, how could that have happened? Who could have possibly seen this coming, right? It, we already know how this story ends. So I guess it's like, that, that's part of the reason why I say like, if you don't have to do it, I would encourage you to find other ways to do it. Invest in India. You've got all sorts of opportunity. Right. The second thing I would say is for the American investor, for the US investor who doesn't have really that same option, what we're trying to do at firms like Simplify is take advantage of this through the derivative space. Sometimes we're gonna do that really well, sometimes we're not gonna do that well. Um, we've done it in fixed income securities, we've done it in interest rates, we've done it in credit. Um, we're still trying to you know, nail down how to exactly do this in the equity markets because candidly, it's really hard. That, that alpha dynamic is challenging and the options markets are really hard. So. Like we have vehicles that I think are super interesting and provide investors with ways of diversifying their portfolios and ways of protecting their portfolios against some of the unique risks that exist on theories of passive. But what happened in the US markets this year, interestingly enough, is a, a, is a function of a totally related but separate phenomenon, which is another type of vehicle that has exploded in the US is what's called a target date fund. Um, target date funds or systematically rebalanced portfolios that basically buy a certain proportion of bonds, buy a certain proportion of equities, and then rebalance them on a regular basis, give rise to really weird behavior in the presence of an actor like the Fed being super aggressive. So if you think about what actually happened in the US markets this year, imagine I run a portfolio that is 50-50 bonds and equities. The Federal Reserve hikes interest rates very aggressively bond prices fall, what do I have to do? Sell equities, buy bonds, right? Federal Reserve hikes interest rates, bond prices fall mechanically. It's a non-arbitrage condition. What do I have to do? I have to sell equities, buy bonds. That pattern defines exactly what occurred in the United States this year, where portfolios that were combined of both bonds and equities were hit actually worse than portfolios that were basically isolated to either of the two. So, so, so it's like, there's no, I wish I had great solutions for the US market. It's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be talking to countries like India and individuals in places like India, because I still think there's an opportunity here. We have a painful adjustment in the United States. We, we have to take the cancer out. You guys don't yet have it fully embedded. Very interesting. So, so uh, a question is coming from Karan Chaudhary. So he's, uh, you know, he noted the fact that you've worked for for Peter Thiel's uh, uh, fund, Thiel Capital. And uh, what he's trying to figure out is, given that you've cited all this academic research done in the last couple of years on what Passive is doing to the American market, and there are experts like you who have now sussed out the problem, um, how, how actively are you know, smart family offices and institutional investors in America 
now seeking out solutions from experts like you to the subject. Are we sort of, you know, uh, halfway down that path or is the journey not even begun uh, in a serious way? Um, I wish I could be more encouraging on this. Um, I think, you know, in, in general, first of all, remember that rich and smart are not always the same thing, right? In the case of Peter, it is. I just want to be very clear on that. Um, the the challenge here is, is that one, um, you'll again, you'll notice like all the academic research that I was citing and referring to is all 2020 and later, right? So everyone who's running a family office or who is the hired external manager managing a university endowments assets, for example, or a pension plan, they will have come up through an educational system that teaches them that passive is harmless. Right, or that gives them some sense that, well, once we get to much higher levels of passive, or as the academics were citing in 2022, that passive is really not that big of a problem. Search up what is the market share of passive in the United States, and you'll see any number of things saying, well, it's around 15%, it needs to get much larger before it becomes a problem, right? So what's happening, and, and unfortunately the reaction to this is, it's like most other things. America will do the right thing after exhausting all other possibilities, right? right? Um, and you know, we will eventually solve this. I just wanna be very clear, like we will figure this out, we'll react to it, we'll have a crash of 87, we'll have a regulatory change environment, et cetera. Part of the reason I'm out there talking about this is one, I think that there's really interesting opportunities that emerge from it, but the second is because I want to make sure that the narrative has some semblance of no, people actually did know this was happening and yeah, did yeah. highlight that this was occurring, right? right? Because when it does happen, when the events occur that are like XIV in the S&P 500, you can't let Vanguard say, well, nobody could have seen this coming. Yeah, that's a beautiful answer. I should throw it to you for the last question for the, of the evening. Yeah, I think uh, uh, one of the things that several several investors on the call are asking is uh, is how is it that they should now think about their portfolio? So given the evolution where India is at, do you think that they should continue sticking with active managers or do you think there is a, a correct percentage of active and passive uh, that they should go for uh, when they think about their retirement savings? So if you were sort of investing in the Indian markets, uh, how would you approach it? So... Again, remember the definition of passive investing always holds every security that can't actually happen in the real world. So nobody can be a passive investor. What you're actually asking me is what fraction of my portfolio should I put in a strategy that simply says buy and hold, right? That's an individual choice that becomes a function of what you think the opportunities are for India itself becomes a question of how broadly distributed are you? 50 stocks is not broadly distributed across the Indian economy, right? So my quick advice would be, this is a little bit of an element of the tragedy of the commons, right? Um, if everybody tries to index, then it's a disaster. If you as an individual try to index, then you're actually creating a localized good. You're managing money at lower costs. And in many ways, you actually are going to get superior performance. But the right question to ask yourself is what proportion of my portfolio do I just mindlessly want to buy and hold or dollar cost average into the same companies without any form of critical evaluation? And the answer is that is some segment of your portfolio. Like you really do want to participate in equities as an asset class. You really do want to look at India and say there are opportunities here that I should be invested and I should participate. But that is an individual choice. And again, like India as a country is at the share of passive that is still a positive. It's introducing heterogeneity into the predator prey dynamics. The problem is, is if you don't recognize that, you don't take steps to arrest the growth before it becomes where it is in the United States. So I'll offer my 10 cents on that, Achin. So uh, Michael made the, the scary point that we should not in India create a, a, a 401k type pension fund industry where uh, by compulsion, the fund manager has to uh, index. So Michael, we don't have compulsion, but what the government, what India has is something called the national pension scheme yep. where, the, uh, where the regulator, where the government has capped the maximum fee that the fund manager can charge. I think the cap is around 10 bips or 15 bips. Now, because it's capped, because the national pension scheme 
EMP is capped, as you can understand, most of the money inside it is uh, is passive, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 it's caught on very nicely over the last decade. The National Pension Scheme has, um, uh, and it's tax advantaged. It's tax advantage. So, uh, in fact, we, we at Marcellus did a webinar a year and a half ago, uh, telling the world that people like me, I put in as much as I'm uh, legally entitled to. I stick it into the NPS because I get the tax relief and I get the low fees. So, the way I do it, uh, folks, the way I do my passive is I take advantage of the NPS because it gives me super low fees and it gives me a juicy tax break. Um, uh, and effectively, I end up with roughly 20% of my of my equity portfolio. I end up with 20% of my equity portfolio in passive. So on a given any, any given month, one in five rupees of my savings, one in five dollars of my savings goes into the NPS, thus giving me a 20% passive, 80% uh, active uh, ratio now i didn't i didn't i haven't done the sort of scientific work michael has done uh, but that was just my way of trying to trying to capitalize on a on a on a, on a regulatory arbitrage in a way uh, but i will get so, this go on michael no i was just going to say i mean one of the things that you highlighted there is one of the mechanisms that india can use right so you talk about a cap of 10 to 50 basis points my guess is that's tied to the asset space one of the things that india can do is encourage new managers uh, to emerge, right, and to participate in that system. And there's things that you could do that would allow you to withhold fees, for example, into a collective and then uh, compensate smaller managers who emerge, right? Um, right? Doing effectively affirmative action in a positive framework where you're encouraging new entrants and experimentation. Go. That's what builds robustness in a system. The great irony is, is that if you put that cap manager's incentive is to maximize their profitability, what are they going to do? They're going to pass it. Yeah. Right? They're yeah. going to just buy the available index. And the larger you get in scale, the more profitable that becomes for you. So we will send a recording of this to the gentleman who runs the NPS trust for the country. Um, he's a smart man. He was an active asset manager, ironically, in his first twilight. life. Yeah. Uh, hopefully there will be an audience. Thank you very much, Michael Green, for a wake-up call to those of us in oh, India. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I, I really enjoy these types of events. And uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, wishing everybody a good weekend and a happy new year to everybody and a happy new year to you, Michael, as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you very thank much, Sarovan and Ashwin. Thank Thanks. you. Take care. Goodbye. Hosting us. Bye. Bye.